Hello, I'm JW, and this is a voltage-operated earth leakage circuit breaker. Now, this is a pretty old one, and as you can see, it's a fairly large item as well. In fact, all of these are pretty old because they haven't been used for at least 40 years, as they were made obsolete in the 1980s. Now, these were used on TT supplies. Those are the ones where you've got your own earth electrode. There's no uh, metallic path back to the transformer in terms of the earth connection. And it's necessary to use these things because on that type of system the earth loop impedance is fairly high, typically in the many tens or even hundreds of ohms. So if a fault occurs between line and earth, the amount of current that flows is very small, usually only a few amps or so. And of course that's not going to be enough to cause a fuse to blow or trip a circuit breaker. So these things were used to disconnect the supply in the event of that sort of fault happening. So have a look at this one, see what's inside, and maybe able to actually get it operating. Now this was sent in, and I've unfortunately misplaced the uh, details of who sent it in, but uh, thank you to whoever did send this in, and it was quite a long time ago. This is branded Siemens, which would have been Siemens Brothers at this sort of time period. And on the front here we've just got the uh, main button here to switch it on, a couple of smaller buttons for testing and switching it off, and then this thing here, which is unscrewed to allow you to remove the front cover. This is quite a sizeable piece of equipment. As you can see inside there, it's a uh, considerably uh, deep piece and uh, fairly sizeable pretty much in all dimensions. It comes mounted on this wooden backplate thing. And again, that was fairly common for equipment at the time. You wouldn't normally just screw it straight on the wall. Just a uh, fairly basic wooden construction. Still got the range of the wiring here. So we've got the red and black on the top here. Tin copper wire inside. Have a look at that a bit later. And again, the two here coming out of the bottom. And what's missing here would have gone through the hole here, which are the two earth connections, which would have been coloured green in the case of this thing. Now, the point of these, I say, was on a TT supply, and this would have been used where a fault occurred between line and the earth of the installation. This would detect that and then disconnect the supply. Now, it's important to note these are not RCDs, and they don't work in the same way as RCDs, and they don't provide any protection from somebody coming into contact with the live conductor. So if someone grabs hold of a live wire and you've got one of these on the end, absolutely nothing will happen. They'll just be continuously be shocked until it's disconnected via some other means. So if you have got any of these type of things hanging around in any installations, they really should have gone away several decades ago. Now this one can be undone fairly easily just by turning this screw here. And then the entire front can be lifted off. Now the screw there does have a little hole through it, so in theory you could put a sealing wire through this lug here and then onto that to prevent people from undoing it. That will be fairly important because as you can see inside, once you've removed the lid, you've got big chunks here of exposed live parts, both at the top and at the bottom here. At the top here we've got the main terminals, so clearly marked line and neutral, or live and neutral it would have been at the time. And this piece here is the actual switch mechanism. These two contacts uh, pressing down onto the pieces of metal here to either make or break the circuit. And we have a look on the side. These are actually in multiple segments here. So you can see they can actually just be uh, fanned out like that. This is fairly typical of things which are also rated for use on DC, as you've got a considerable number of different contact points there. Whether this thing was rated for DC or not uh, isn't particularly clear cover here just says 60 amps 500 volts. It doesn't say AC or DC, but it's certainly the case that uh, that is a fairly common arrangement for switches and isolators which actually were used for DC. So basically that's in the open position and when closed it's just pressing those against these to make the contact. This would have been the incoming supply generally and then that would have gone through when connected through to the bottom. It's coming out on the two wires here at the bottom. Now the bottom here, the same uh, terminals coming out, so again your line and neutral. And we've also got the other two terminals here, which is where the earth connections would have been, these two items here, one of which would have gone to an earth electrode, and the other one would have gone to the earthing for the installation. So that would be the earth terminal in your fuse box. And again, that will be connected to any kind of equipment attached to the system, so metal cases of uh, pieces of equipment like washing machines, Kettles, socket outlets, and possibly some lighting if it was of the metal cased variety. 
Now this large piece in the middle, when it's pressed, it just pushes down and latches in place, so it's basically pressing the contacts closed here at the top. Current can flow through normally, and that's pretty much it. This doesn't have any overload capability at all, so in that regard it is just a switch for on and off. Now the way that this works is that on the side here we've got this large coil. This is just insulated wire wrapped around uh, many, many times. And uh, when you apply a voltage across this, you'll get a magnetic field. And inside we can see there's this movable piece of metal here. So a magnetic field applied here, that causes this piece of metal to move. And when it moves in, presses on lever, which then releases the mechanism opening the contacts. And we can see from the top here, there's the coil there. And as you press this in, it just latches in. And then whether it's tripped by this or the little green button, which does the same thing, just springs open, releasing the contacts at the top there. Now the way that this gets a voltage is that this coil, or the two ends, are connected to those two terminals you saw before. So one goes to the actual electrode outside in the ground, and the other goes to the installation. And the idea is that if a fault occurs within the installation between the uh, line conductor here and the casing of the installation or some part connected to this terminal, you'll get a voltage between this and the one that's outside connected to the earth electrode. That puts a voltage here and that causes it to trip. So it only works if you've got a fault between this and some earthed metallic part within the installation. That's why it doesn't do anything if someone, say, got hold of a live wire, because of course they're not connected to either of those terminals. Now traditionally these things are supposed to operate uh, anything up to about 50 volts. We'll see what this one operates at uh, shortly. We can just apply a voltage directly between the two terminals here. Now on the top here, as well as the button there to latch the thing on and the green one to switch it off, we've also got this red button, which is actually for testing purposes. So here's the test button, and it's spring-loaded there. You can see the spring in the middle. So in the normal position, where it's up here, this piece of metal here, which actually goes down there and across to this terminal, and that would be the one that's connected to the installation earth, so the thing in the fuse box, that's actually connected here, through that little piece on the top there. However, when you press the button, it disconnects that there, so then you're no longer connected. And at the bottom here, it actually connects to the line or live terminal here. So it's disconnecting there, and then immediately afterwards connecting to that. And that's applying that voltage across the coil, which obviously should then trip the thing and disconnect. And it's important that it actually disconnects the installation first, because if there was some problem and it didn't actually trip, you'd actually be connecting the 240 volt supply directly to the installation earth, which then would result in that 240 volt showing up on all the metal items in the building. So as it's pressed, it disconnects first and then connects the uh, test button or the test contact at the bottom, which then should trip the device. The green one and the solenoid both uh, act on the same piece here, which is this bit here. This bar basically pulls forward and then inside there's another piece which pulls down and then releases the latch there and then it will pop open from the spring. So if we press the button, then that just pops up. And the same thing would occur here as this plunger is pulled in, presses here and then pushes that piece in and out and trips the mechanism by either method. Now we're not going to be connecting this to 240 volts, mainly because it could go uh, horribly wrong and explode, and of course there's all these live parts exposed as well. But we should be able to trip the device just using a bench power supply. So we've just got the two wires here. These are DC, but again it shouldn't matter, it's just about creating a magnetic field. So if we just clip on to the two terminals here, uh, just the other one there, and then we'll place that into the on position. And uh, we'll just turn on the supply here. And if we just increase the voltage, then we should see that it actually trips at a certain point. So we'll just turn up the voltage, so about half a volt. So one, two, three volts, four volts, five, five and a half. So five and a half volts seems to be plenty enough to trip this device. And that's actually pretty good because, say, these things are supposed to work up to about 50. 50 being the... Uh, perceived sort of level at which uh, touching items wouldn't be particularly fatal, but obviously a lower trip level is certainly desirable. So uh, if we just turn it off again, 
and we just again turn up the voltage. Yep, so just around five and a half or six volts there to trip that. At the five volts there, it's using about 60 milliamps of current there, so nothing uh, particularly excessive there. If we reset, if we turn the voltage up to a more realistic level, say uh, 15 volts, which is uh, getting pretty low considering it will be lined to a fault, it should trip as soon as we turn on the power. Yeah, there it is, so uh, still seems to work as intended. Now, of course, the problem with these things and the reason they were removed is primarily that they don't provide any personal protection. So if you've got one of these or its equivalents on installation, someone grabbing hold of a live conductor, this will do absolutely nothing because it's only looking for that voltage between the earth electrode outside and the electrical installation itself, as in metal cases or equipment. So if someone is grabbing hold of a live conductor, it's not going to cause any voltage to occur here, and it, of course, will do absolutely nothing. These were in use up to around 1981 in various forms. This is a fairly older one, but uh, they all work on basically the same principle. If you do come across one of these things, it needs to go away immediately. i say it doesn't provide any protection really, other than the faults between the installation and some earthed metal part. And certainly in terms of uh, peak or whatever, it's going to do absolutely nothing. There isn't really any way of testing these anymore either, because all the test equipment that used to go with these, of course, is long obsolete and was removed 40 plus years ago and although you can theoretically just uh, shove a voltage onto the uh, exposed part of the installation or possibly even use a, a loop impedance tester on high current that doesn't really prove anything these things really are relics from another age now just have a look at this wiring here because again this is a fairly common thing which you'll see fairly often this was the black one just a bit of black uh, insulation comes away there it's not too clear what this is. It looks like an early kind of uh, plastic material, but it's very brittle there, and it's got a sort of papery cotton covering over the top. It doesn't look like rubber particularly, although uh, job to tell, because uh, although rubber insulation was common once, various types of plastics were used, including things like PVC as in modern cables, but also stuff like polythene and various other bizarre combinations. So either way, that's uh, past it. Now this is tinned copper wiring, so basically it's solid copper with a very thin layer of tin on the outside and that's why it looks uh, shiny silver like this. Important to note that this is not aluminium wiring. Aluminium wiring was very rarely used, it was only used for a, literally a very short period in the 1970s and that was generally copper clad anyway so it wouldn't have looked like this uh, even if you did find it. This is very very common. The reason for the tin coating was that originally when cables had rubber insulation the rubber tended to react with the bare copper causing it to tarnish and corrode so the tin was put over the top to prevent that from happening so you'll find that tin copper wiring is incredibly common and even when other materials for insulation were developed so PVC particularly a lot of manufacturers continued using the tin copper for many many years until eventually in the sort of 1970s 80s they discovered that it wasn't actually necessary to do it anymore so of course it became bare copper obviously that was slightly cheaper now if you find this stuff it's still perfectly fine to use because after all it is still copper wiring the presence of that microscopically thin tin layer doesn't really change anything so perfectly fine to carry on using now one way to check that this is really copper is to look on the ends particularly if you've just recently cut it so if just get a, uh, some cutters here just snip a bit off And have a look at those ends. A bit to see here, but those ends are copper coloured, so it's copper throughout. It is just a thin layer of tin on the outside. You could also scrape away at it with a knife if you wanted to, and that would reveal the copper underneath. So if you come across any of this stuff, it is perfectly fine to continue using. It's solid copper. Current ratings things are exactly the same as they would be for a solid copper without the tin covering. If you come across something and you think it really is aluminium, then unfortunately this has to go away immediately. You can't continue using it, and you certainly can't say fit any consuming units on something with aluminium wiring, because the problem is that aluminium wiring does not have the same current ratings as copper. It has to be considerably larger, and good luck finding any details on the current rating of small size aluminium conductors. As I say, that's incredibly rare. Chance of honey are nil, 99.9% of the time it's just going to be tin copper, so no problem with that. 
So that is pretty much it for this video. I have done another video in the past on how these things actually work in some detail, so that's going to be linked on the screen and in the usual places there. But until next time, thanks for watching.